Well, good evening. Once again, my name is Christopher Wisner, and I'm one of the pastors here at First Church. And it is an honor to be delivering the message today. Pastor Candace is out celebrating and uh, partaking in the graduation of her son, Carlton. So we are excited for all that's going on in their family's lives. Speaking of college, when I was in college for my bachelor's degree, it's around maybe 2005, I was a, a part of the Baptist denomination, and I would go on these mission trips with my grandparents. My grandparents um, were Methodists, and they, uh, they encouraged me in the Methodist way as I was uh, growing up. And these mission trips were like life-changing experiences. Um, I had the opportunity to serve people from different, with different ages and backgrounds and genders and, and denominations, and I learned a lot about faith, what it means to like follow Jesus, right? And, uh, and what it looks like to love people and to, uh, especially those who are like culturally different than I was. And after those mission trips, I, I saw the world differently, right? Like things changed for me. However, after my last mission trip with my grandparents at least, I, um, I headed back home to Savannah, Georgia, and I was getting prepared to go back to college in Dahlonega, Georgia, and I had got all my stuff ready, got the car all set up, my Kia Sportage, got it loaded, and I'm off, and I'm going back to Dahlonega, and I'm, I'm kind of going a little bit early, and um, the, uh, we, me and a roommate, we, we rented our first apartment. It's the first time I ever rented an apartment. I lived in the dorms before then. And so I drive some uh, five hours. I think I got a map here. It kind of shows like the length of the drive here, right? So I drive over five hours uh, approximately. I think I went the shorter route. And I get there. It's late in the evening, Saturday. I open the door to my new apartment. What do you think I forgot? Keys? No, we got the door open. The electricity. You got to turn on electricity. You got to turn on water. You got to get an internet, like phone, all those kinds of things, right? Like I forgot all of that. I didn't, well, actually, I not even forgot. I didn't even know, right? Like this was the first time I had ever experienced any of that. And so here I am in a Saturday evening. It's getting dusk. It's getting dark, right? And I got, I got nothing. So you just kind of make, make do with what you got. And so in this empty quiet space it gave me time for like some reflection and some prayer and i remember while praying um uh, while laying on my mattress which was just on the floor right uh i remember praying and and kind of discern like what's what's next god like what's the next adventure that you're going to send me on and i heard like an audible voice you're going back to the united methodist church and i went what how can that be they ordain women. Oh, they ordain women. And so I had a struggle early, uh, early in, my, in my faith of trying to understand why women lead. And so in our series, Ever Wonder Why, we've looked at why Jesus, and we discovered the God um, of compassion. And last week, Pastor Candace preached on why bad things happen, right? And we discovered that God who loves, loves us so much, that he gives, God gives us free choice, free will to make our own choices. And that God does not bring bad things to us. Today, we're going to explore why do women lead in the United Methodist Church? Why do women lead? But first, will you pray with me? God, you created females and males in your image. Help us to hear your voice as the only voice of truth in our lives. Holy Spirit, we know that you are in this place guiding, teaching, and leading us. Help us to follow the ways of Jesus, and may you speak through me. Amen. So in ancient times, there were these females and males who were called prophets. And a prophet is a person who who is directed by the inspiration of God to proclaim God's will. A prophet is a person who is directed by the inspiration of God, by the Holy Spirit, to proclaim God's will, to share with, the, with all those around what God's thinking and how God would like us to proceed and move forward in life. And today, today we really don't use that term prophet as much. We generally call them like preachers, prayer warriors, 
maybe, maybe kind of like holy people or somebody that you would, you would go to, right, for discernment. Someone you trust and say, I, you know, I think God usually speaks through them, and so I can, I can trust them. And I, so I'll go to them and say, you th- can you help me understand what this means? Or can you help me understand what this event in my life means? And so we go to these people for this direction, and a lot of times, the prophets, especially in the Bible, like spoke of what would happen if we don't follow God, right? Like it is some serious stuff. And I think that it's very similar, though, to a mother or father who gives stern warning to their children about the direction that they're going. If you go this way, this is going to be the result. This is going to be the consequence of uh, what, um, what can happen. And so these prophets led the people, the Israelites, through very, very difficult times. And so we're going to start tonight with a prophet named Miriam. And she was with Moses and Aaron through, uh, for the Exodus. And this is when the Israelites were set free from their Egyptian slave masters. And so we start in Exodus fifteen twenty, And it says this, Then Miriam, the prophet, then Miriam, the one who is inspired by God to proclaim God's will, Aaron's sister took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for God is highly exalted. Both horse and driver God has hurled into the sea. Right? Like God had just done a marvelous work. And then they come at the end of this, and, and they just, the, the Red Sea was split, and they walked through, all the Israelites walked through, and then the, the waves came crashing down on the Egyptian army, and Miriam's like, hey, we need to praise God right now, people. We just got set free. We just got set free. Leading the people into worship and praise of the God who saves. The prophet Micah, he has his own book in the Bible. It's actually, it's actually kind of near this, this middle section over here, right? And Micah, he says this in uh, Micah uh, 6, 4. It says, I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron, and Miriam to lead you, to guide you, to take the people from where they were and to pull them out into a better spot. Absolutely amazing then then there was deborah (laughs) deborah is probably one of my favorite uh, people in the bible and deborah she was a judge so we have moses we have the exodus they come out of the exodus right and then we have this new nation that's forming and moses is like this is way too much i need some people to help me out so he says i'm gonna have some judges and what the judges are going to do they're going to be the spiritual and civic leaders of, of, uh, of, of, of areas, of Israel, right? And so there'll be a lot of judges all over the place to help with this task. Now, today in our modern time, we think of the church and the state as separated, right? So we don't think together. But for the judges, this is one and same. They're leading, <laughs> they're leading services as well as the same time um, coming over here and then taking uh, and ruling on matters of, of civil interest. And so Deborah was this judge and she, uh, and, and, It says uh, right here in book of uh, Judges, uh, chapter 4, verses 4. Now, Deborah, a prophet. Now, Deborah, a person inspired by God to proclaim God's will. The wife of uh, Lapidoth was leading Israel at that time. And so I said there was lots of judges, but this one, the Bible points out, this one's leading Israel. It's almost almost like a head judge on top of that. And Deborah was amazing because not only was she like this civil leader and she was ruling and judging, not only was she like the spiritual leader, but she was also a military leader. And she led, she led up in the front the, ar- uh, the Israelite army into battle and into victory. Absolutely amazing. And let's not forget about Huldah, right? We all know about Huldah. Right? Yeah, exactly, right? Like, honestly, we kind of forget about Huldah because she's really tucked into this dense history of, uh, of Israel. So she's tucked in like chronicles and kings, right? But there's something very, very interesting for us today about Huldah. And so we have the Exodus. We come out of the Exodus. We have judges. And then we have the reign of kings. 
right? We had the reign of kings. And after King Solomon, Israel crumbled. And the north and the south split. And the kings are just being nasty to each other. And they are leading the people all kinds of different directions over a long period of time until a guy named Josiah. And Josiah was a good king, and he sought to reform the country, and he and wanted to lead people back to God and back into God's ways. And so when he was doing this, he was working with the priests, and they were all trying to figure out how to do this, and lo and behold, they find this book of the law, uh, the law that was lost, right? Because we had all these kings that allowed the temple to go in disarray. And this book of the law, we believe, is the book of Deuteronomy. And so they get this book of the law, and they go, what do we do with it? We don't get it. And so we see in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 14. All right, friends, here's what I'm going to remind everybody, right? Some of these names are really, really hard, okay? So we're just going to kind of go with it, right? We feel me? You with me? All right. <laughs> Hilkiah, the priest and friends... <laughs> Went to go speak to the prophet Huldah, right? <laughs> went to go speak to the prophet Huldah. Skip a few. She lived in Jerusalem. <laughs> Think about this. The king, the priests, find the Bible, the book of Deuteronomy, and what do they do? They're like, we don't know. We need to go to the prophet Huldah. She can speak on behalf of God. She can tell us how to understand this text and how to, how to bring it out into our lives. And she does. And she does. It's absolutely incredible. These powerful men go to her because she is a prophet. She is inspired by the Holy Spirit to proclaim God's will for the people. Absolutely amazing. Now, after Jesus was raised from the dead, there will be even more women who are mentioned as being inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak God's word and do God's work. So we catch up and we, move, we jump to the back half here, to Acts. And we find in Acts 9, 36, it says this, In Joppa there was a disciple, a, a follower of Jesus, named Tabitha. And she was always doing good and helping the poor. And, and, and then there was uh, the Apostle Philip, who we read in Acts um, 21 9, he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied, who were speaking God's will to the community, was speaking on behalf of God to all those who would listen. And then we have Paul. And Paul speaks about some amazing women building up the church and proclaiming God's word to the people. And we find this mostly in uh, Romans chapter 16. It's kind of like a, a thank you letter to these women who are doing all this marvelous work in the early church to proclaim the good news, to share all that Jesus had done for the world. And it says this in uh, 16 verses 1 through 2. I commend you. So this is to the church. Like they would read it just like this. I commend you to our sister Phoebe, a deacon. It would be no different if I was going to like go on a vacation. Pastor Ken's going on a vacation. And we pulled Mateos up here and we said, hey, I commend you to Mateos, right, to, to, to follow him, right? To, he can be a deacon. He can follow you. He's saying, hey, I commend you to her, Phoebe, as a deacon of the church, and I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help, right? Any help. What, basically, whatever she says goes. Any help she may need from you. For she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Her works, her witness, is a testimony. She was a deacon a crucial leader of the early church. She was called into the ministry of organizing people and resources to take care of orphans and widows and to proclaim the word of God. 
And then we come to Junius, the apostle. We don't use these titles uh, these days. So here's what an apostle means. An envoy of Jesus Christ commissioned directly by him or by other apostles. Normally someone who has been taught directly by Jesus and who is invested with the authority to speak on Jesus' behalf, on God's behalf. That's an apostle. And so Paul would say, like a, a, as he, as he kind of looked at it in, uh, in his epistles, an apostle is someone who essentially knew Jesus, whether pre- or post-resurrection, knew Jesus and was commissioned to go and proclaim the word of God. Commissioned. And so we see in verse 7 of Romans 16, you see these two names. And on first glance, you might, might be just run right through it, might kind of miss this. And this is, <laughs> this is why it's important sometimes, right? We've heard it, you've heard it said before, right? Context matters, right? So in all these names, it is important to understand in these names, are they males or females, right? It, it helps us understand what's going on. And so it says in verse 7, Greet Adronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles. And they were in Christ before I was. Greet Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles. And they were in Christ before I was. Absolutely amazing. And so the same God who calls Miriam, Deborah, Huldah, Tabitha, Philip's four daughters, Phoebe, and Junia, is the same God who calls women today into leadership in the church and into the world. God shows no favoritism here between men and women. Just as it took us many years to recognize slavery is wrong and discrimination between races is wrong so too it has taken us too long to see the calling and leadership of women in whatever they are gifted and called to and when we hear of all these women it does make us wonder right like we hear of all the women in the bible and go wait, wait a minute well what went wrong after the early church what happened and at this point there are many reasons that historians and theologians give for this um, for this change some say that Christianity was contaminated by the empire and it became, when it became the dominant power due to Constantine around 380-ish. Others say that the world was always dominated by men in hierarchies. In other words, kings and queens, and some people are better than other people just by being born, just better than other people, essentially. That's all that means. And Christianity just kept up the tradition. And there's some truth to these ideas. There are also those who focus on two verses. Think about all we just traveled through. We went through the, almost the whole Bible there from beginning to end almost. Two verses found in Paul's writing that suggest that women are not allowed to teach or have authority over men. And given the litany of women we found teaching, I think it's highly unlikely that that is what Paul meant in those texts. Some want to split hairs on titles in the Bible. They're similar to the Pharisees, in my opinion, who didn't see God. Jesus was right in front of the Pharisees, right? Didn't see him because they were too busy with titles and rules and regulations and all those other things to see God, Emmanuel, with us right there and then. God doesn't care about our titles. God cares about our hearts, right? Like, hear me on this. God doesn't care about our titles god cares about our hearts like we are all enabled and empowered to go and use our gifts and to live into our calling so i think there are some better questions that can help us today as we think through why do women lead and the first one is this do you believe God is working in the world. 
Do you believe God is working in the world in the here and now? Are we, are we looking around to see what God is doing? Are, are we listening to others to hear what God is doing in their lives? And I think, I think at some point the church has kind of lost focus on seeing and hearing God at work in the world, and especially in the lives of women. Simply put, the men in charge, they just weren't listening. Is that news? Men not listening? <laughs> right? <laughs> Sorry, I had to, guys. We had to. Got to get that in there. So what changed now, now that we have women who lead in church and society? Because they do. What changed? I think it started with the Reformation. Martin Luther broke the church Emphasis on law, emphasis on hierarchies, emphasis on titles, and you're better than this, and you're more spiritual than this, and you're closer, more closer to God, broke all that and said, no, we're all servants of God. We're all empowered to go and answer our calling. We're all able to go and share the good news with our friends and families and those whom we'd never met before. And so people started having access after the Reformation to the Bible. And one of the key tenets of the Reformation is that any of us could go and pick this up and start reading it and that God's spirit will teach us what these words mean will teach us how to understand God's word will be will teach God will teach us God's self and so people then began to have new freedoms they didn't have they started to use their voices and over time people began to revolt against kings and queens it almost takes me back hey all the way back in the Old Testament, we got a king set up, and now we're coming back almost on the other side of, now we're tearing down kings and queens. You hear me? Any Americans in the house today? <laughs> right? Come on now. Like, America came from this time of upheaval. And the first article of the Bill of Rights is this. It's pinned this. It says this. It's beautiful. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. This recognition of this right that is inherited to all of us, not given to us, it's part of us. God-given. Enabled us to start to be able to have people to speak freely. To start to be able to share their thoughts and share their ideas and so guess what people took it up they started to share all kinds of people some people who we like and we were like we want to listen to them and some people who are different and you know what it takes a lot of patience and it's hard but we have to listen and allow every person to have their freedom of speech in other countries in europe they're going to follow suit and they're going to start to adopt similar laws and over time women would be empowered to share their voices this is the change that took place first through speech then through the vote and so women began to share with more and more began to share with more and more people what god was doing in their lives they were able to start writing books they were got to share their perspective on god and life and so much more and Methodism, the Methodist movement, started by John Wesley, was one place where women were given extraordinary opportunities to use and enact those gifts. There are two convictions that we as Methodists hold as being central to our understanding of our faith, of Christianity. The first, and I heard you all, by the way, I heard my, I heard my, my strong Methodists out there, right? God is at work in the world today. God is at work in the world today. We don't hold on to deism like God's just separate somewhere else, kind of hanging out, got the whole thing started, and, and now God's absent. God is at work in the world today, and we believe that the promises of God, while there are still some yet to be fulfilled in the very, very back, but that God is the not yet it doesn't stop the here now, and that God is currently fulfilling them through the church, and we believe in the power of God being active and now. And the second is this. We live out our faith. We live out our faith into the world. Love is the primary mark 
of being a Christian. We don't sit around thinking and thinking. I mean, we got good theology and we got really, really smart people. But let me tell you, they get up and get going and doing the work of God, amen? And we feed the poor. We take care of orphans and widows. We advocate for those who are oppressed. We pray for others. We read our Bibles. We visit with those in jail. We support our friends and family with words of encouragement and prayers. And we love all people just as God loves all people. And while all this is happening, we are preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? So when we see and hear God at work in women's lives, how could we not follow them? How could we not? Here's a great, uh, great story of our very, very early uh, Methodist foundations, uh, especially in America. There was a gentleman whose name was Richard Allen. He, was, he grew up as a slave. And he was freed by Reverend Freeborn Gerritsen. Gerritsen was a Methodist preacher. And John Wesley, uh, uh, the founder of Methodism, the, the one who's kind of got it started with a bunch of other guys and gals, <laughs> saw God at work in the lives of black people and understood Jesus' command to love all people. And so he vehemently fought against slavery. Under Wesley's uh, um, uh, rule, a Methodist, layperson or clergy, could not have slaves. So Gerritsen uh, released all his slaves, and Richard Allen was one of them. And he found a home in the Methodist way. He became a preacher and was certified as a preacher in the very beginning of the, the first Methodist Episcopal Church. So after, after America found their freedom, right, fought for their freedom, the Methodist Church split from the Anglican Church, and Methodist Episcopal Church is formed. But Richard kind of noticed something. While Gerritsen and many other Methodists were willing to give people um, their, their freedom from slavery, they weren't quite ready to listen to them. They weren't right, ready, ready to include them in the full life of the church. And so at one point when he was, they were just absolutely discriminated against in church, he left. And he started the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME, due to racism. Now, I share his story only because of Jarena Lee. You see, Jarena, she was called by God to preach. In fact, this is, this is what she says God said to her. Go preach the gospel. I will put the words in your mouth. Go preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. I will put words in your mouth. And so she goes up to uh, Bishop Richard Allen to be, uh, be licensed to preach. Back then, you couldn't just go preach. You had to be licensed. You had to be certified. <laughs> Maybe not certifiable, certified, okay? All right. <laughs> There's a difference. There's a difference. Context matters, remember? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I love it. That's love it. That's good. And so he says, no. Can you believe it? He says, no. There's no provision for women to preach. It was unorthodox. It didn't happen. So no. And so I love this. This is what she asked him. If a man may preach because the Savior died for him, why not the woman? See, he died for her also. Is he not a whole Savior instead of half a one? Whew. Come on. Preach to us, right? And he refuses he refuses until he hears her preach. And when he hears her preach, it becomes undeniable that the Holy Spirit was with her and she was authorized by God to preach. And so all he did was say, okay, I'm getting out of the way. I'm getting out of the way of what God is doing in her life. And as far as I know, she is the first woman in America to preach and is absolutely the first African-American woman empowered to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So unfortunately, it won't be until 1956 that the Methodist Church gave women full clergy rights. And when the Methodist Church and the Evangelical United Brethren Church came together, they formed the United Methodist Church. 
right, in 1968. And they were right on the spot. All women were given full clergy rights from the beginning. So I'll give you a little bit of this history and we come back to this question. Why do women lead? Because God has called and gifted them to. All women everywhere are given gifts and called to do something within our communities and within the life of the church. I've only given a glimpse of what all the women who have, uh, have done to build the church and to build our communities and build up America and build up the nations and all the world. They have worked tirelessly for Jesus and their stories are still being discovered in history just as we continue and just as women continue to write new stories today. I love this, what John Wesley said. He says this, when the witness, the witness, proclamation of the gospel, the sharing of Jesus, when the witness and the fruit of the spirit, peace, patience, self-control, together, there could be no stronger proof that we are of God, that a person is of God. Women will continue to lead and find places where their voice is respected and cherished. And I want to say this right now. This church is a place for you. This church is a place for you. And so I'd like to give you two challenges this evening, if that's all right. Two challenges. First, I, tell, I, I challenge you today at, at dinner or maybe tomorrow at lunch to share at least three women who have made an impact in your faith life with a friend or a family member. Perhaps share. Share a little bit of women who have made an impact or, better yet, call Call them and share how they have impacted you in your life. I want to kind of loop back around before I give the second one. Remember those mission trips I was talking about? On those mission trips, we would meet up with the local, her name was Dr. Paz, and she was a dentist. And at each place that we would go to, we would start our time with her preaching. Now, y'all, I don't know a lick of Spanish. I don't. I don't I, I've taken way more classes than I should. So I don't know all that she was saying. But I will say this. I, I don't know of anybody that I've seen, and I've seen some amazing, amazing preachers who preached with more conviction, more fire, more zeal than her. I can only tell you what I saw and experienced. Her love for God and her desire for people to know Jesus was absolutely a sight to behold as she shared the gospel with people in these communities. And not only was her witness verbal, but she backed it up by how she lived and how she interacted with people and how she spent all the days of her life continuously giving and giving to her community to make her community a better place. And so here's the second thing. We are all called and gifted by God. Every person in this room has an opportunity to be part of something bigger than yourself. So I want to challenge you to encourage one another to use your gifts and bring your talents this community here supported, encouraged, and inspired Pastor Candace, the 48th pastor of First Church and the first woman senior pastor to bring her gifts, to listen to God's voice over others' voices, and to live into her calling. You all did that. Yeah, uh, hey, <laughs> give God glory where it is. You did that. You're part of her story. When I talked with her for the very, very first time, she'd ask me, when's one time that God had spoke audibly to you? How about that one? Or like when God spoke to you, and how about sharing that story? And that was a short story I shared with her. And she smiled, and what I didn't know is she had some similar things going on in her own life. Absolutely amazing. And if it was not for your support, she would not have become a past, the senior pastor, and she never would have reached out to me. I wouldn't even be here. How about that? So I'd like, I'd like to show you one more picture, one more slide up here. Whew, makes my heart melt. I'm thankful for, thankful for my daughter, Chelsea. She's two right now. 
And I'm thankful that she's part of a church family and a denomination that I know her voice is going to be heard. It's going to be respected. It's going to be cherished. And if she is called by God and, and is given those gifts, that one day she too can stand in front of a pulpit and share God's words with each and every one of you. So whatever her gift and calling may end up being, I just know that this community is going to be with her. And so all of us, all of us should give words of life and encouragement to the young ladies in our church, to the ladies in our church. Encourage them, encourage them to serve God, to use their gifts, to bring the good things here into the church, to know that their voice is going to be respected and appreciated. And if you are ever asked, if you're ever asked, hey, why do women lead in your church? Why do you have a, a woman senior pastor? You just simply say, because God has called them to and they are gifted to. All to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Oh. <laughs> yeah. All to the glory of God. Friends, let us, uh, let, us, uh, let us pray. God, we thank you that you have called every one of us into your service a service of love, a service of caring for one another, of encouraging one another, of strengthening one another. And so, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would sweep through this place. And as we go out from this place, we would share stories, share the stories of people who have made an impact in our lives, and especially those women, the women who have, who have spent their lives striving to build up the church, striving to build up this community. We give you thanks for their witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.